morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for worship. If you're joining us on YouTube, please take a moment before you leave and subscribe to our channel. That will help us connect with more people. If you're joining us on Facebook, please share and comment. Let us know how we can pray for you and encourage you in these days. Today is a big day. On our American calendar, this is Memorial Day weekend, a day we remember and give thanks for those who have given of themselves for our country. On our Methodist calendar, this is Aldersgate Sunday, the day we remember John Wesley's heart being strangely warmed as he experienced God's grace at a Bible study in 1738. And on our Christian calendar, this is the Sunday we celebrate Jesus' ascension to the Father following his resurrection. Our opening hymn today develops out of this last event. In Crown Him with Many Crowns, the hymn we're singing about is Jesus. In the hymn, we sing about the Lamb upon his throne. This is the Lamb of God slain for our sins and raised up from the dead to bring us life. This very Jesus, crucified and risen, lives and reigns now and forever, and he invites us to live with him. If you are able, please stand and sing with us. Christians profess and live by is shared with believers around the world. Throughout the ages, the Apostles' Creed is a basic summary of that faith. Will you please join me as we affirm our faith together? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thanks so much for your faithful support of the church and its ministries. Your generosity is a blessing to us. I know that your generosity beyonds merely giving here. You know the need around us is great. Each week we hear of more people in our country, millions more being laid off. Our prayer is that the economy recovers quickly and that these people can return to the work by which they support their families. In the meantime, God has gifted many of us with provisions that enable us to take care of our families and to watch out for those needs of others. Just this week, one of our people told me about running across a man who was living in his truck. He had a place to live, but didn't have the resources to get electricity in the building. Our person had been blessed with enough that he was able to pay for the man to get the electric wiring he needed. There are a few ways you can support our ministry here. First, you can bring your offering by the church office. Second, you can mail your offering to the church at 201 North Mount Street, Fairfield, Texas, 75840. Third, you can go to our website, www.fumcfairfield.org, and give through the giving link there. Let's pray. Father, thanks so much for your generosity. We praise you for being a giving God. You gave your only son so that we might live. Thank you for providing for our families and for the work you call us to do. Open our eyes to the needs around us, whatever kinds of needs they might be, so that we can join with you in meeting them. We pray specifically for those in need today. Provide them with the resources they need to support their families. Let them see you at work. Teach us all to be generous with sharing your blessings with others. Amen. Our next hymn is part prayer, part testimony. In the third stanza we will sing, Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. This is a testimony, on the one hand, of our experience of grace. God's grace has claimed us and made us new people in Christ. On the other hand, God's transforming work isn't finished in us yet. We still feel our weaknesses, our propensity to wander away from God. Knowing the reality of God's grace gift, we call out for more of it so that we will be made completely his. Will you join me now as we sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing? of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious song and sung by flaming tongues above praise thy mountain fixed upon it mount of thy redeeming
rescue me from danger Interposed his precious blood Oh, to grace how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Would you please join me in prayer? Our most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have made and the opportunity to be able to join together for this time of worship. Father, we trust that you are with each and every one of us as we praise your holy name. We come to you today as we adapt and navigate through this challenging world surrounded by uncertainty and anxiety. We continue to pray today for those who are suffering and pray for their healing and comfort. We pray for those who are caregivers and family members and loved ones, all of whom are sharing your love with those in need of care and mercy. Father, we know that you are the great physician and we ask that your healing power flow to those in need. We pray for those who have lost loved ones and, and are grieving. And are grieving during a, a more difficult time of social distancing. Be with them, O oh Lord, and provide them peace and comfort. We pray for those who are facing uncertain times and for those who are concerned about their careers and finances. We pray for our church that we may soon come together face to face to worship, to learn, and to have fellowship with one another. We pray for those entrusted to lead us into this time safely and ask that you be with them as they prepare plans and discern your will. We breathe these concerns before you, God, as we are reminded that you are the God that calmed the storms and made the wind cease. Lord, you have called us to be your hands and your feet, and we ask you to lead us, to guide us, to direct us as we reach out to our brothers and sisters and respond to their needs and concerns. As we lift all this up to you, O oh Lord, we let us dedicate ourselves to spend more time in your word and in prayer with you. Father, as you are the love and the light of the world, may each and every one of us let your light shine through us at this time and always to lead others closer to you. Father, you are so gracious to us. Enable us in return to live lives marked by gratitude. Enable us to give graciously to others following Christ's example of love. Enable us to think of ourselves less often as we learn to put the lives of others ahead of our own. Father, on this Memorial Day weekend, we pause to honor the men and women in uniform who have done that to the fullest extent, placing our lives ahead of their own. We hold them in our hearts today. For their example of 
courage and selflessness and love, we, we give you thanks. We ask that you continue to protect our men and women in our armed forces until their work becomes unnecessary and peace shall reign forever. Father, we lift all this up to you as we pray, as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Today we'll be reading about the events leading up to Jesus' ascension as found in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 1 through 11. We'll be reading from the New International Version and invite you to follow along in your own Bible or with the words on the screen. Beginning in verse 1, we read, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Can you imagine the roller coaster ride Jesus' disciples had been on? First, they'd encountered a man, Jesus, who called them to leave everything and follow him. They'd seen the miracles. They'd heard the teaching. They'd seen him confounding the so-called wise and powerful. Everything seemed to be progressing upward. Then everything went downhill for a while. Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. The disciples' attempt at resistance was thwarted, not just by superior numbers and arms of those arresting Jesus, but by Jesus himself. Jesus was put on trial. Jesus offered a completely inadequate defense. Jesus was convicted of blasphemy and sedition. Jesus was beaten. Jesus was taken out and nailed to a cross. Jesus died and was buried. It's hard to get much lower than publicly executed, dead and buried. But then on the third day, they started hearing about strange happenings, an empty tomb, some appearances to a few of them. Then finally, Jesus appearing to the disciples, showing himself to be alive. Up, then down, then up again. I bet they'd even describe themselves as flung around side to side. During the time he'd spent with them after his resurrection, Luke, the author of Acts, tells us that he spoke about the kingdom of God. It's hard to imagine a subject more exciting to them. They've been waiting all this time, not just since the resurrection, but since Jesus first came on the scene. They finally asked the question that they all wanted answered. Is now the time you're going to restore the kingdom? We'd thought you were starting to do that 
when you triumphantly entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. But you fooled us. Now, however, that you've gone through death, you've defeated death, you've shown the authorities, both the authorities of our own people and those of the mighty Roman Empire, to be unable to stand against you. Now is the time to do the David stuff. Now is the time to get the kingdom going, just like he did. We're even waiting for you to expand the kingdom, like Solomon did. Come on, Jesus. Jesus doesn't tell them what they want to hear. His response can be broken down into a few parts. First, though it's not in the text, I suspect he sighed deeply. I've been teaching you guys for three years. You've been with me day and night all this time. You still don't get it? You don't know what you're asking. Second, Jesus changes the subject away from the kingdom they had in mind. He says, it's not for you to know the times or dates that the Father has set by his own authority. Or we could paraphrase, you want to talk about dates? That just shows that you don't know what you're talking about. There's more going on here. Third, Jesus points to what will happen shortly, to the event we call Pentecost. He says about that, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We're not talking here about a little dinky kingdom of Israel, looking far beyond a mere restoration of what David or even Solomon had. We're looking to the very ends of the earth. Did you catch the exciting part? The disciples themselves will have a key role in what's going to happen. God's plan is for the whole earth, all people everywhere. And these disciples, these disciples who still understand so little, are going to be God's key agents in making it happen. If I were among the disciples that day, I'd raise my hand and ask more questions. What do you mean, Jesus? Can you tell us more? What do you do next, Jesus? Jesus, or Luke as he tells Jesus' story, doesn't cater to our questions. He tells us that after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. So here are the disciples. They've been visiting Jesus through these weeks after his resurrection. They've been talking about his kingdom. They've hungered for the restoration of the kingdom. But now Jesus disappears from their sight. They'd seen him disappear from time to time after these post-Easter visits. This time felt different. This time seemed more permanent. So here are the disciples looking intently up into the sky as Jesus is going. More strange things happen. Two men, well, at least they look like men, appeared before them. We'd probably best off understanding them to be angels. Why do you stand here watching the sky? This same Jesus will come back again in the same way. Man, that's good news. When's it going to be? We want it to be soon. We're dealing with a worldwide pandemic. We're faced with bad people trying to take over our country. Not that we all agree on which are the bad people and which are the good people. We're living with an economy in meltdown, with millions out of work. We see Russia, China, and radical Islam on the move. We see all these things and we cry, How long, Lord? Surely now is the time to come back. What should we do in light of this promise of Jesus' return? Well, what did the disciples do? What did they do in Acts 1 when they heard this promise? Did they say, hey, how about we go put on white robes, climb a mountain, and wait for the day? Or did they start organizing and strategizing to take over the political structures of their day? Or did they settle for having conferences where they talked endlessly about the exact signs of Jesus' return? Well, no, they didn't do any of those things. The rest of Acts chapter 1 and leading into Acts chapter 2 
which we'll get to next week, they primarily did two things. They filled the hole in the, left in their number by the defection and death of Judas Iscariot. They gathered for prayer. Then from Acts 2 onward, they set about doing what Jesus had told them in Acts 1.8. They were his witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Why did they do this? What were their background convictions that made them do this? Have you ever noticed how we tell the story of Jesus in the Apostles' Creed? He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And from there, he will come to judge the quick, the living, and the dead. There are many details left out here. We're today considering a couple of these near the end where it says he ascended into heaven and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. To understand what's happening, let's go step by step. The word heaven is a good starting point. Heaven, as encountered in the Bible, has three senses. First, it's the sky, the place we see birds and clouds floating and flying by. Second, it's the place where we see stars and planets what we might sometimes call the heavens. Third, heaven is the place where God is, where his throne is. We get in trouble when we run these together and think that God is someplace out there, maybe out past Pluto. Well, the up into the sky or out there might have fit the disciples' visual experience here in Acts chapter 1. They didn't think Jesus was floating off in the sky somewhere. When we talk about God being in heaven, that way of talking about heaven is something like what we today might call a parallel dimension. Christian theology affirms God's transcendence. God is very different from us. God is not just another object in our world. Christian theology also affirms God's eminence. God is close to us. God is an active agent in our world. We bring these two, transcendence and eminence, together when we talk about Jesus as the incarnate Son of God. Jesus is fully human. He's God with us. Jesus is fully divine. He's God, the transcendent God, with us. During his life on earth, Jesus was like us. Like us, he could only be one place at a time. Now that Jesus has ascended to heaven, the relation between heaven and the spaces and places on earth, he can be anywhere and everywhere. That's how we can make sense of Jesus' promise that he would be with us always, even until the end of the age. So that's the ascension, but the ascended to the Father. What about the seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty? What's going on there? The seated at the right hand of the Father points to what Jesus is doing. There are a couple of Old Testament passages that would be helpful to consider here. First, Psalm 110, verse 1 and 2. The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. We can read the Gospels and see how Jesus and the Pharisees got into it over this passage. It's the Old Testament passage that's most frequently quoted and alluded to in the New Testament. The claim here is that the Messiah is the king, the one who will rule. It's the first text, the second Old Testament text is Daniel chapter 7. Now pick up in verse 9. Daniel's having a vision. And he says, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. 
The court was seated and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words of the horn that was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and his body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Again, if we read the Gospels, particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you notice that Jesus' favorite term for himself is not Messiah or Son of God. No, he refers to himself as the Son of Man. What's the Son of Man doing in this text in Daniel? Now, we see there are clouds, like we see in Acts chapter 1. The Son of Man was led into God's presence, the Ancient of Days. That's what we've been calling the Ascension. But there's more. The Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7 is given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Do you remember what Luke said Jesus was talking about with his disciples in the days between his resurrection and his ascension? He's talking about the kingdom of God. Do you remember that the disciples took this to be a restored kingdom of Israel, a kingdom of David, take two? Jesus had much more than that in mind. We see the same thing going on at the end of Matthew's gospel. There, at the beginning of what we call the Great Commission, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Do you notice how much authority has been given to him? All. All authority. The claim of the New Testament is thus, that Jesus, having ascended to the Father, now sits at his right hand. His job, if we can call it a job, is ruling over God's kingdom, over God's creation. Ever since Jesus' ascension, Christians have looked forward to Jesus' return. We hunger for His coming. We look at the brokenness and suffering in the world, and we say, How long, Lord? Come quickly. But is that all we do? Not at all. Let's go back to Daniel. We didn't read the whole of Daniel 7. In Daniel's vision, there are some weird monsters coming into the world, before that bit we read about the Son of Man. In Daniel 7.15, Daniel admits that he doesn't understand what he's seen. The vision is confusing, so he asks for help. As part of the explanation that's given to him, he's told, But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. So, which is it, Daniel? Who is going to receive the kingdom and possess it forever? Is it the Son of Man figure, or is it the holy people of the Most High? From our New Testament perspective, we'd ask the question, Who is receiving the kingdom? Who will be reigning? Is it Jesus, or is it His people, the saints? The answer we find in the Bible is yes. We can see this starting way back in the first chapter of the Bible. And in Genesis chapter 1 we read, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule. There's that word, rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So when we read this passage, what can we say that God created humans to do? He created humans to rule over creation as his stewards, as his representatives. 
We see the same thing in Psalm 8. We see there, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings, or if we go to other translations, the son of man that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than Elohim, a little lower than God, and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. Stop here and remember Psalm 110. Under the feet. Continuing in Psalm 8, All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, all birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. So who is it that's supposed to rule? It's humans. It's Jesus, the Son of Man, who is God become human. Let's try one more passage. Ephesians 2, 6 and 7. Paul writes, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Jesus has been raised up to the Father. That's his ascension. Jesus has sat down at the right hand of the Father to reign over his kingdom. And where are we? Right here in Ephesians 2.6, Paul has said that we... The people who have put our faith in Jesus, we are seated with him in the heavenlies. Some of you will say, well, you're just nuts, Paul. We're not in heaven, we're on earth. Can't you tell the difference? But remember where heaven is. Heaven is the place of God's dwelling, the place of his throne. God is close by, all around us, never far from us. Therefore, being seated with Christ in the heavenlies, that's a dimensional thing, not a place thing, as we think of places. So here we are. We see Jesus crucified and risen. We see Jesus ascended into heaven. We see Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father. We see Jesus ruling and reigning. And we see his people. We who have put our faith in Jesus included in that ruling and reigning. What does that look like? What are the practical consequences? I'll close with three brief consequences. First, because we are his people, we can come to Jesus with confidence. He is for us and not against us. He hears us when we cry out to him. Today, are you taking advantage of that privilege? When you have needs, when you have burdens, do you bring them to him? Second, a key aspect of our ruling and reigning with Christ is that we are called to bring every aspect of our lives into alignment with his kingdom and his kingdom ways. Because of this, we need to ask ourselves some questions. And we can ask ourselves those questions right now. Are our relationships aligned with Jesus and his ways? Are our finances and our use of possessions aligned with Jesus and his ways? Are our words and attitudes, whether spoken or written, aligned with Jesus and his ways? Are our attitudes and desires aligned with Jesus and his ways? Having asked these questions and continuing to ask these questions, where there is a gap, where there are aspects of our lives that are not yet aligned with Jesus and his kingdom, are we consciously and intentionally submitting them to him for him to correct them, for him to correct us? Third, and this flows directly out of the second, we live as witnesses of this Jesus. Wherever we go, he wants people to be able to see him and to know him through us. As every aspect of our lives are aligned with him, people will come to see him more clearly. They will even come to faith in him, trust him with their lives, and give their allegiance to his kingdom. You notice, don't you, that this is way more than going to heaven when you die. You notice it's way more than just being a nice person, a church member, a moral person, or a good citizen. Because of Jesus' 
who he is and what he's done. You are kingdom people. Will you submit yourselves to his kingship and live that way? Let's pray. We thank you, Jesus, for giving your life for us. We thank you also that your plans and desires for us are beyond anything we can imagine. Yes, you desire to forgive us for our sin. Yes, you desire to remake us so we are like you. Yes, you desire us to live with you forever. But you also desire that we will reign with you. That's scary, Lord. It's scary not because we doubt our ability to handle that level of authority, but primarily because we know we are sinners. We know ourselves well enough to know we're not ready for that level of responsibility and authority. Since that is what you desire for us, however, we invite you today to make us the kind of people that you can work through. We submit every area of our lives to you, our fears, our worries, our anxieties, our finances and our possessions, our plans and intentions, our relationships, our emotions and desires. We give them all to you and ask you to bring them each into alignment with you and your kingdom purposes. We give you all that and give you free reign in our lives because we trust you, knowing that you love us. Amen. You have heard the good news of Jesus the King, not just the once and future King, not just the King in the deep recesses of your heart, but the one who even now rules and reigns in glory. Go now as his people and live according to his purposes, walking in his joy, his love, and his peace. Amen.